When you're in a, uh, an isolated recording studio when there's no sound and it's just dead, and that's, you know, that can be very good for what you want, but for us, it's like we like having some you know, space around us and we didn't want to go into a, uh, a recording studio like that. Um, because it's almost like, because it's so quiet, you feel the need to fill up all the space with stuff. You know, it's like, oh, well, I have this, you know, uh, te technological capability to just layer as many tracks as possible. Um, but with Krungbin, it's like we're in the barn. It's like, oh, I can hear this bird, or I can hear this tree gently scraping against the side of the building. It's like, you know what? Just leave that. I'll play around that. Like when we listen back to... Uh, um, Como Te Quiero. And it had the little scraping tree, and you can hear it. And we were like, oh, the take is ruined. It's like, no, it's not. It's perfect. It's exactly what you need. And I think it contributes to the visual world, because I think, you know, subconsciously, it's putting you somewhere. Yeah. Uh, like as a listener, you know, if you hear a little kid laughing in the back of the song, or, you know, or bees, or whatever it is, it's like all of a sudden you're, you're somewhere in your mind. You know, for me, a lot of the times when you're working with samples, you're thinking of the sound and not the space that it's existing in. So very often you're like, oh, that sound, but I have to gate that and I have to filter out the low end and I have to compress it because I need to capture the sound. Whereas here, I was capturing sound and space and that applied to actually all of the field recordings from this project. So I had to let go of that need to kind of clean up the samples and become okay with trying to figure out a technique to involve all the texture and actually not clean up uh, most of the sound that I had recorded to like an OCD degree, but work with it. So I make music in two places. I have a, a nice studio, which is soundproofed, and I'm lucky enough to have daylight, and I have really big monitors in there. And then I also make music in my apartment, which is a bit like this room. It's a Berlin Altbau with high ceilings. And sometimes I just really enjoy the intimacy of getting up and walking around my pajamas, getting coffee, just doing stuff at not super loud sound or whatever. Yeah. And I have different gear at home to what I have in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you listen to my first album, I recorded a lot of stuff in, my, in an outbow I lived in back then. And there's a lot of sound leakage from this room and from this kind of place, like, there are characteristics of that which can never be taken out. Some people like to make very clean music and underneath they'll put like Atmo, right? Um, but then it's, it's like a choice thing. Then you can separate it if you want. There's something I kind of liked about the idea is it's there. It's always going to be there, you know? Right. And you can't remove it. You can maybe sidechain it. You can maybe EQ it, but it's always going to be there. <laughs> In one sense, we want to fill spaces with a sound that is more appropriate. So if you take like a, a shopping centre, uh, usually the music that's played is deeply obnoxious and entirely not in keeping with either the brand or the brand and the space and the experience that you want to have. So it's a classic Brian Eno idea. I mean, going right back to music airports, I mean, we, we literally have done music airports. And the first job is to do an audit of the space, which would find resonant frequencies, find what ambient noise already exists that we can't alter. And so, yeah, my composition then has to obviously be sympathetic to that. So if there's a, a, a cash machine, an ATM, that beeps and it's a certain note, then you know, I can't conflict with that. So I'll, that will often be a reason why I might compose a piece in a certain key. It, there's a wonderful sense of being in the space and then uh, uh, obviously mixing and you know, sometimes dramatically changing the piece that you've done once you experience in the space. And that's, that's super important. So my, my family home where I grew up is in the rural countryside in England um, and we've got quite a lot of fields behind us uh, and our back garden is always home to lots of birds and wildlife and uh, I think the first sounds I recorded were the rain sounds because my home studio was on the top floor of our, uh, of our house you would always hear the rain kind of pattering down on the, uh, on the roof um, and there was something really nice about taking just my camera microphone out, it's just a little Rode Video Micro, fairly cheap camera uh, microphone, but being able to sort of record these sounds and under an umbrella or going outside with some microphones and just kind of getting a feel for what, you know, what, what is in your back garden. Um, it's something that's so familiar to me, it's what's so familiar to a lot of other people as well. But um, yeah, I, I don't know why nature just seems to provide really interesting source material for, for sampling. 
for me at least, it's that kind of unpredictability. It's the sound of something coming up and kind of going away again. It maybe is a tone that isn't sustained. It's maybe not the same pitch every time. Um, and when you play this as part of an instrument, even if it is tonal, um, these little unpredictable flourishes that come in and out, the sound of a bird cooing or the sound of rain falling in a particular rhythm, um, is it, it inspires you then to create something else. And I think an old teacher of mine always said that before you paint, you need to build the canvas. And for me, this, this forms as a very good textural bed uh, for, for making my compositions. Thank you.